So welcome everyone. We are here today to hear from Chelsea Price and her session is When Programming Isn't Fun Anymore, Fighting Job Burnout and Relighting Your Programming Fire. Chelsea's been the director of the Messervy Public Library and I want to tell you this right off the bat, Messervy has a population of 250 people. She's been there for about five years. She is a regular blogger for the Programming Librarian website, and she's done several presentations at a variety of conferences on programming on a small budget. Chelsea also has a book about programming in tiny libraries, which was written for ALA editions and is set to hit the shelves in fall of 2020. So please join me in welcoming Ch Chelsea to our room today. Thank you, Becky. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for coming to hang out today. I'm going to open this. You guys can't see it if I open my chat, can you? Or can That's you? correct. We will not see that. Okay. I would love... Um, that was a really great introduction. I forgot that I had written my little bio or whatever. Um, but yeah, hopefully that book is still going to come out in the fall. I'm still working with the editor. Um, so I don't know if this pandemic is going to slow it down or not. We'll see. Um, but yes, as Becky said, I have been the director of the Missouri Public Library um, for five years now. And Missouri, we are just a tiny little rural farming town um, in North Central District. We're pretty close to the um, Minnesota border. And I've been there for five years, but prior to that, you could kind of say that a librarianship is in my blood because um, my mom was also a tiny library director um, for probably about 20 years when I was growing up. And I worked there with her shelving books and answering phones throughout high school. And then her mom, my grandma, was a school librarian um, from ages 40 to 80, which is just crazy to me. But so I've really grown up in and around libraries. I feel very comfortable in this position and it has felt like a good fit for me ever since I ever since I started. Um, so I'm going to be talking in this presentation mostly about small libraries just because it's my own experience, but that's obviously not to say that large library staff don't experience burnout because that's obviously not the case. Um, but I am curious to know, um, oh, no worries, Becky. It's a lot of people say Meservy, but it, yeah, it's Meservy. It's kind of a strange name, but um, I'm curious to know um, if we have a lot of small libraries in here, if everybody wants to just kind of type in the chat, what size library are you coming from today? Haven't seen an A. Oh, I saw one A, two A's, three. <laughs> so we have, oh, we do, population 144. Okay, so we are kind of just all over the board here. Um, we have quite a few A's, but we also have quite a few real big ones. Um, so I also, ooh, does anybody work, at, are you a one-person library? Do we have any one-person libraries in here? Yes, one person. Well, let's, even if we just have that, Okay, one person, we do. Can everybody, I know we can't hear you, but can we just all give the one person libraries especially a little round of applause because that would be crazy. I have a two person, including myself, and I could not do it without my, so yes, definitely clap, big round of applause for the one person libraries. So a lot of you probably know, particularly the small library staff that, um, you, when you work in a library like this one, um, you have to wear all of the hats. You are not only a library director, but you're also the children's, the teen librarian. You are the programming, the marketing, the outreach librarians. You are um, an accountant a lot of the time. You are your own IT guy sometimes. Um, you're a janitor, you are, um, let's be honest, sometimes we are kind of babysitters, like I hate to say it, but it's the truth. Um, and that can be a really stressful, uh, stressful thing. Um, I want to talk a little bit, oops, let's see, about Missouri. You can still see my slideshow, right? I'm getting paranoid. Yes, we can. Thank you. We <laughs> see your lovely little building there. Okay, I'm going to close out of the chat. So Becky, could you just let me know if anybody has a question for me? Absolutely. 
Thank you. Um, so as we said, Missouri is a little under 250 for our population and our city limits are in total about a mile and a half. To be honest, I don't even think we have a stop sign in town. I really don't. There's not a lot here. It's very small. Um, oh, darn it. Okay, there we go. Our school closed in the early 80s, and then um, we did have a school about five minutes away, and that closed about 10 years ago. And the school's closing has really hurt, hurt us as far as young families in the area. So now the nearest school in our district is about 20 to 25 minutes away. Um, as I said, I'm a two-person staff. It's me and my library assistant, and I really depend on her a lot for program planning and things like that. Um, we are only open 20 hours a week. Um, our library building is just one large room. We don't have any separate spaces or anything. And obviously, as you can imagine, our budget is also very tiny and we have to really try and think outside of the box when it comes to planning good programs um, on the money we have. Um, so everything that you would want to do <laughs> is not in Missouri. It's at least 15 minutes away. Um, so we don't have a grocery store or a gas station. We don't have a community center of any kind. Um, we don't even have a bank anymore. Um, so what's in Missouri is a church, a post office, a bar, because of course we have a bar, and we have my little library. And um, so the library has to kind of serve as the community hub. Um, we are by far the town's largest meeting space. We're the only source of free entertainment in town, and we're the only source of free Wi-Fi in town. So I would say that programming is definitely the biggest part of my job, um, just because I think it's so important to provide that free programming events um, to the community. And it is, I would say in a library like this one, it's just as important as the materials we offer to the community. Um, so yeah, even though programming is the biggest part of my job and most of the time I do love it, I'll be honest, there are a lot of times when I just don't, I don't feel like it. I'm tired from other things. I'm, I just did like a huge program and I don't feel like doing more. I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and I just don't feel inspired or excited about planning new programs. And I'm guessing that if you're in this session, you have felt that way a lot of the time as well. Um, and, um, it can be really hard to plan good programs when it, it feels like your gas tank is on empty. Um, and if you felt this way for a while, you know, there's a chance you could be on the road to burnout. So we're going to talk, um, about the symptoms of burnout, how you can avoid it, um, some strategies and self-care tips. Um, and then we're going to talk about resources to get you inspired again and make you excited about programming. Um, just so I'm going to interrupt really quick. Would you like to be interrupted for questions or would you like me to save them till the end? Um, I can be interrupted. I think that'll be fine. Okay. So Christine has asked if you have good turnout at your programs. Mm. <laughs> well, it varies. I've had, I do a summer carnival, which if don't do that without help, I took on too much. It's too much, but I do a summer carnival where we have between Mm, I want to say about 400 people, which is crazy because that's more than our town's population, but that is not the norm. I've also had zero people at a program, so it really varies pretty wildly. Um, I would say the average for a youth program is between 20 and 30 kids. Um, so yeah, we, we, we do what we can. Um, but this, this Pro, um, presentation is based on a blog post that I did for Programming Librarian blog. And um, it's out of all the posts I've done for them, it has gotten the most feedback by far. And I've received emails from library staff across the country saying things like, oh, I'm so glad you wrote this because I felt the exact same way you were feeling at that time. Um, I'm dealing with a lot of stuff at home and I don't, I'm, I'm glad you put words to it. Um, so I think it's, it's something that definitely a lot of library staff feel across the board. Um, and I think it will be especially useful, even though we're probably not working open open hours. I would hope your library is not open at this time. I don't know. But um, 
I think a lot of us are just feeling, if not burnt out, we're just feeling stressed and confused and exhausted. Um, so even though when we talk about the symptoms of burnout and factors that can contribute to burnout, it's going to be, you know, it's not an upbeat topic. Burnout is not a joyful, happy thing to talk about, but then we're going to pivot and talk to talk about how you can re-energize and reinvigorate yourself. Um, and I hope you'll walk away feeling not sad about the state of things, but hopeful for the future of your, of your job and excited to plan new programs when we're allowed to have programs again. Um, let's, and if I apologize if my teeth are chattering because my heat, the heater in the library has gone out and it's a little bit chilly in here. So I'm shivering through this. Um, so first we're gonna talk about recognizing burnout, the signs and symptoms to look for. And these are just a few of them. Burnout can have many, many symptoms. Um, so irritability, um, that's a big one for me because usually I'm pretty even tempered and I'm, I don't get angry or upset too easily. Um, but if I can feel myself, these kids come in every day after school, they're fighting over the computers, over Fortnite, over Roblox, and usually I'm like, okay, guys, I'm going to set a timer. And when this one gets on, this one can get on. But if I can feel myself like, oh my God, I'm ready to snap. I know that that's a red flag for me personally, that something, something ain't right. Um, a lack of energy. If you're feeling sluggish while you're at work and you don't really want to do much, but sit behind your computer and check out books to patrons. Um, that's a red flag for me as well. Um, if there are things that you used to be really excited about doing, like maybe you really love planning to toddler story time. That's a fun one. Who doesn't love toddler story time? Planning the songs and the felt boards and figuring out what props you're going to use. If that's something that used to bring you a lot of joy in doing, and now you're just kind of like, oh, do I really have to? That's um, definitely a sign um, that you might be starting to burn out. So burnout has a lot of physical um, symptoms as well. It can present itself in the form of stomach issues, um, headaches, like just a feeling of full body exhaustion. Um, and obviously, even though I do wear a lot of hats at my library, doctor definitely isn't one of them. So you should go to the doctor if you're having these symptoms just to rule out anything else. Um, and finally, you're unsatisfied with your accomplishments. So if you normally um, thrive off of receiving positive feedback from your patrons or from your community or from your library board, and that used to bring you a whole lot of joy and get you excited about, about your job, and it's just not doing it for you anymore, um, that's definitely something to note if you don't feel inspired when you receive awesome feedback. Excuse me. Um, that's those, So those are definitely some things to keep an eye on. Um, as they can, they can be symptoms of burnout. Um, I do wanna note that a lot of the symptoms of burnout can mirror um, other serious issues, especially um, clinical depression. A lot of the symptoms of burnout are very similar to depression symptoms. And um, so again, it is important to see a medical professional if, you're, if these symptoms are chronic for you and nothing seems to help. Um, and there is no shame. I have, I have clinical depression and I try to talk about it as much as I can because I don't think we talk about it enough. And I think it's so important. And I honestly think that this might sound crazy, but I think counseling or some form of therapy sometimes should be almost required for people who work in a public service field, um, just because we have to deal with so much on a day-to-day -day basis. So just keep in mind, there is absolutely no shame in in seeking out help uh, for your mental health. And self-care does not replace mental health care. Um, so, okay, sorry. The contributing factors that could be contributing, um, we have a couple job-related factors, some home life factors, as well as some um, personality traits that could be um, contributing to burning out. So job expectations. I as I said before, in small libraries particularly, um, all the responsibilities are on your shoulders, especially if you don't have any other staff to lean on and, and 
have there for support, it's all on you. If I, if something goes wrong, it's on me. It's on my shoulders. I have to deal with everything. And that can be a lot. And obviously in large libraries, they wear, you know, in big city libraries, they have to wear other hats. Sometimes they have to wear the, they have to act as a first responder almost, or a social worker, or an advocate for the homeless or the drug addicted. And they, those are, you know, those are big hats to wear. That's a lot of, of responsibility that they take on. Um, and I'm guessing that most of you, whether you have your degree in library science or not, I'm guessing that your degree or your training probably did not prepare you for most of the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. I know my training did not. <laughs> um, there, this job, of library director is such a unique one. There's not a lot of jobs like it where you'll have your seem to have your hand in every pot and and have to do a little bit of everything. And it can be really stressful and we're expected to do it all with a smile on our face because we're serving our community and we love to serve our community. And and it can be hard to keep that smile on your face. Um a lot um let me see. Oh, lack of job related support. Um, so I'm willing to bet that for a lot of you, your budgets shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink a little bit every year. I know mine is. And um, you're still expected, no matter how low your budgets go, you're still expected to pump, keep pumping out the same quality and quantity of programs, no matter how low your bank account gets. And that's a big stressor for sure. Um, also, a lot of libraries in Iowa are very, not very, but they can be pretty geographically isolated from other libraries, and not a lot of libraries in Iowa are part of a system. So a lot of you may, it can be lonely. You can feel without that support system sometimes. Um, and sure, you can join an association, or you can attend a conference and meet other like-minded people who you can lean on, but guess what? That costs money. And it's money we probably don't have in our budget. Um, and, you know, it, it can be frustrating at times and it can feel lonely. Um, and, and it can also sometimes feel, maybe, maybe I just sound bitter and I don't know, but sometimes it feels like your community or your library board, what have you, they don't acknowledge or sometimes even notice all of the hard work that you're doing for your community. Um, there are some people out there, believe it or not, who think that librarians, we sit behind the desk and read. And people, I, I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Um, they think we read all day. And it can be, you know, a little disheartening to say the least. A chaotic work environment. Um, so if you haven't noticed, libraries are not quiet places anymore. Uh, when you serve as the hub of the community, you know, it can be chaotic in the library sometimes. We're not, librarians don't shush anymore. We're, we're encouraged not to shush and to actually encourage kids to be messy and be noisy and have fun at the library. Um, and it can be hard to get work done. And I'm I'm guessing that a lot of you don't have an office of your own to go into or is even some of you a desk of your own to get work done. And of course, a lot of us, it's not in our budget. We're not supposed to, um, we're not supposed to get work done when the library is closed because it's not in the budget. So we're either ending up taking home work with us, which we're not supposed to do, um, or we have to get it done when the library is open and that can be really tough. Um, I also want to say with um, smaller libraries, you really get to know, and I'm sure at larger libraries too, um, you really get to know your patrons and you um, are, you become kind of so enmeshed in the community that you can find yourself taking on the struggles and hardships of your patrons and making them your own. Um, that um, that little girl who comes in in the winter with no shoes and no coat, you think about her when you go home. You worry about her. You worry about uh, about the kids getting enough nutritious meals in the summertime. You take those problems on as your own. And and it seems sometimes in the field like being an empathetic person 
can be more of a burden than a positive quality, which is sad because being an empathetic person in my eyes is a good trait to have. Um, but it's not good when we're taking on their pain as our own and, and it leads to our burning out. Um, so demands at home, usually when, when most of us go home uh, from the library for the day, it's not, we don't get to sit and relax. You know, there's cleaning, there's taking care of kids or pets or there's significant others. And there's not a lot of you time, which um, I'm sure is true for any job. But um, when a lot of us take our work home, it makes it even harder. Um, an inability to say no. <sighs> you guys, this is my big problem. I'm gonna open the chat just to see what's going on in there. Um, I was we, just going to, uh, while you're reading that, Chelsea, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what was going on in the chat. I've been sort of making notes here and sure. you're getting a lot of yes, me too. Oh, thank oh, you God. for talking about that. Um, the lack of positive feedback was a comment um, early on and the, the, particularly they're talking about the lack of support, the expectations and worry about their patrons. Oh, good. I'm glad that that this is resonating with a lot of you. Um, so my big issue is an inability to say no. I hate saying no. I am a bit of a, I, I hate conflict and confrontation. I am a bit of a doormat and a pushover, I'll admit it. And it, it, it can be so hard if someone says, oh, could you, would you be willing to do this and this? And, and you're, does this sound familiar to this face? Oh yeah, yeah, I could take that on, sure, yeah, no problem. And you know inside that no, I can't take one more thing on or I'm gonna freak out. And if that sounds familiar, like that's my life. And um, it can be really hard, especially in this field where we are kind of, um, we constantly are having to justify our jobs and even our libraries sometimes, whether that's to national government, to your local government, city council, to your community members, um, you're having to justify why libraries exist, why libraries are still relevant, why you, know, why you deserve more money than you're getting. Um, and so it can be really hard to say no because you want to serve your community well. And it can feel, um, um, it can feel, when you're saying no, that you're letting down your community. And that's something I definitely need to work on because I think saying no is so important just for your own health and well being. You can't say yes to everything and you can't take everything on yourself. Um, and finally, an inability to delegate. Um, Let's see, there is nothing wrong with asking for help. I want everyone in here, including myself, to repeat that to themselves every day. There is nothing wrong with asking for help. If you don't have library staff to help you, find a reliable group of volunteers, family, fr family or um, friends that you can lean on for larger scale pro um, programs and that you can ask for help um, because we can't do it all on our own. And guess what? You don't get any medals for trying to do it all yourself. You don't get any awards. So don't be a hero and ask for help when you can feel yourself starting to burn out. Um, so burnout can be avoided um, with some self-care tips and some strategies for balancing your work and home life. Um, and there's a note really quick I want to say about the term self-care. So a lot of the time, social media and society make self-care out to be some frivolous, like going to a spa weekend or a weekend, and it doesn't have to be that. Self-care to me does not have to cost money. It doesn't have to be material. If taking a bubble bath and getting a spa treatment, put on a face mask, if that's what helps you relax and unwind, that's totally fine. But to me, self-care is just about putting on your own oxygen mask before you can help others. Um, Self-care can be as simple as going outside for five minutes every, every day during the day, um, taking your breaks, taking your vacation days if you have them, um, eating a vegetable. Did I already say that one? No, I don't, I don't remember. Um, my self-care personally sometimes is taking a shower that day or 
um, putting on a real outfit these days instead of sweatpants. Um, you know, it doesn't have to cost money or be a frivolous thing. Um, and it's not selfish. Everyone should be practicing some sort of self care. Um, let's see. So avoiding burnout, what can you do to stop burnout in its path? Wendy, you definitely don't have to shower. Um, I just use that as an example. <laughs> I would say it's kind of a free for all in these days. Um, let's see what this separate library from home. So we have to try to stop taking work home with us. I know that's much easier said than done, but even though our jobs are so important, I, you know, we're not neurosurgeons. Nobody, if we don't respond to that email right away, nobody's going to die. Like everybody's going to survive if we, you know, set those boundaries where I'm going to stop responding to emails at this time. Um, and I'm not saying necessarily to unplug when you get home from work because that's not probably realistic. Um, but just make sure and set some kind of boundaries um, when you're at home um, so that you don't get totally just overwhelmed with your with your work. Um, find your find your people. Um, lean on your support system. This is um, with the delegation thing. If you don't have staff, find volunteers, find family, find find friends that you can lean on. Um, join listservs um, and Facebook groups where you can really find people who can give you advice and can commiserate with you and can give suggestions. Um, and contact, this is something I would love to do. I just, in general, I don't feel there's a whole lot of support for tiny libraries particularly. Um, I would love to I haven't done it yet, but I really need to reach out to other tiny library staff in my area and maybe get together and meet once a quarter at one of your libraries and and bounce ideas off of each other, commiserate with, with similar problems you have had, um, ask each other for advice. I think that could be a really helpful way in finding that support system in your life. Um, tidy your workspace. So this sounds kind of silly and like, duh, um, common sense, but I am not an organized person. I am very messy and I, I have piles and piles of papers and unprocessed books and craft supplies all around my desk. And when I do take those few minutes um, to clear that space for myself, um, I can literally feel my like my butt just unclenches and I'm like, oh my God, why did I not do this before? It makes you feel uh, just a lot more clear headed um, and a lot more zen. Um, so don't forget to clean your desk every once in a while. Focus on the positive. I find it can be so easy to, to ruminate on negative thoughts, um, especially when, um, when, Sorry, I, I got distracted by the chat. Maybe I should close it again. I'm going to close it again. Um, it can be really hard to ruminate on the, on the negative stuff, especially, for example, if you've had programs that failed and hardly anybody shows up or nobody shows up. Um, you think thoughts to yourself like, oh, my God, I suck at this. Like, why do I even try to plan programs? Nobody likes, you know, the stuff that I plan. I suck. I'm bad at my job. We have to try to stop doing this. Again, I know it's easier said than done, um, but these thoughts serve no purpose at all um, besides um, making you feel like crap. Ooh, we're getting late here. I'm going to try to rush through, rush through a little bit. Um, but I, what, one of the things that I do to try and think more positively, I have a folder on my desktop um, of the computer at work with um, things in it that just make me smile and feel better. I've got like funny memes that make me laugh. I have animal videos because like nothing makes me laugh like an animal video. And um, I have uh, positive feedback I've gotten from community members or my library board, funny things that kids have said while they're in the library, stuff that I can look back on. Um, and, and it just makes me feel more positive. Um, I just want us all to to keep reminding ourselves that we're doing a great job 
and and stop devaluing valuing yourself and know that you are doing amazing things for your community and your community is so so lucky to have all of you every one of you that's in this room right now um i think it's so important to remember that um find your thing so find a hobby that's not related to work if if reading's your thing that's fine just try to keep it don't read a book um, outside of work and and keep thinking oh i've got to get this on inner library loan for this patron and blah 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 just read for pleasure when you're not at work um find something um that could be mindless and relaxing to you um or find find a passion and just pour yourself into it so that while you're doing that you're not thinking about work related things um for me it's animal rescue i'm really my husband and i are really involved in animal rescue and when i'm you know at walking dogs at the animal shelter or transporting dogs to new homes or um picking up poop i guess i don't know i'm not thinking about the library i'm just thinking about like how much i love dogs and finally get outside um it's amazing what a little sunshine and vitamin d can do for your mood um even if it's just five minutes a day that's still something um and if you do i saw a lot of you in the chat saying what are breaks i don't get breaks but if you do have your breaks at work try to take them and if you do have vacation days which i don't if you're lucky enough to have vacation days take them because you will come back to work feeling probably you will come back to work feeling refreshed and ready to kind of start fresh. Um, I think um, there's no shame in taking breaks. And I think in today's society, we're kind of like hustling or being a boss babe is kind of is really praised and idolized. And like when people say, oh, I, um, I work through lunch, I live at the office, that's kind of a brag more so than a complaint. And I don't think this is an entirely healthy way of looking at work. Um, it shouldn't be our norm to work through lunch or pull an all nighter. And I realize that I'm speaking from a place of privilege in saying this, I just want to acknowledge that. But your health comes before your job. And, and there's no shame in needing to take a break for your health. Um, Oh, I've also seen this really annoying meme that's going around during this pandemic and the quarantine. It says something like, oh, if you're not taking this time to finish up projects and learn a new skill or work out and get your body right for summer, then you're not using this time wisely. And I just want to tell that meme to shut up because this is such a weird time and such a stressful time. You don't honestly, if you don't, want to do any of that stuff don't do it you don't have to i hate that pressure of ugh. <laughs> anyway has anybody seen that meme that's so annoying um we are not superheroes um i think we all need to give ourselves permission to do less um if you're in a position of power at your library where you have the ability to change certain things um particularly I'm thinking about summer reading. Summer reading is such a stressful time for all of us and especially youth librarians. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. If you, if something stresses you out about your summer reading program, change it or stop doing it. Um, if you don't like buying all these stupid plastic prizes that kids fight over or you you know parents probably throw them away anyway you don't have to give prizes you really don't um there are tons of prize alternatives out there um science activity packs um coupons to local businesses just books um and you don't have to give those like oriental trading prizes um if you hate keeping track of the summer reading logs and the kids, you suspect the kids are lying about how much they've read and you're just sick of it and it causes you stress, you don't have to track minutes read. You really don't. There are other ways of doing things if those things cause you stress. Um, you don't have to visit every single classroom to promote your summer reading. Visit one if you want. That'll still make a huge difference. And um, I just think that there have been a lot of youth librarians with a lot of potential and a lot of enthusiasm that have switched fields because 
summer reading can be such a beast and, and so overwhelming and exhausting that they don't want to do it anymore. And so I just want to say, if you're in a position of power, let your youth, I mean, all of your librarians, honestly, but especially during summer reading, let them wear comfy shoes, even though it's not in your dress code, let them wear sneakers to work. Let them, I know it can be stressful and overwhelming if someone requests vacation during June, which is when your summer reading program is in full force, but let them take vacation. Like it's, it'll be okay. I promise it'll be okay. And there's a lot of really great blog posts out there by other librarians about um, revamping the summer reading program to make it um, easier on your staff. Um, I have some examples, but I'll save them till I can get through all this material. So now, okay, we're going to talk about um, relighting your programming fire and finding inspiration and motivation again. So sometimes all it takes for me when I I think it was about a year ago when I was just in a funk, like my dad got diagnosed with cancer at the same time I was going through like a depressive episode and then my dog died and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I don't want to play on, I don't, I don't want to play in programs. I don't care. I don't. And sometimes all it takes for me is a sudden burst of excitement about a really awesome program idea and finding that. Um, little piece of inspiration and then just getting excited about it. That that can really help me sometimes. So we're going to talk about some um, different resources of ways that you can find your programming inspiration. And I'm going to have all of these websites um, on a document. I just sent it like a half an hour ago um, on the document, on the handout, um, on the website. So these are the old faithfuls I use. These are not necessarily, these aren't library related websites, um, but they can be really helpful when program planning. So obviously all of you know about Pinterest. All of you probably use Pinterest. My favorite thing to use it for is if I have a whole bunch of leftover craft supplies um, in the storage closet, I'll just type in, like if I have a bunch of felt, I'll type in crafts using felt and then I'll be bombarded with a ton of ideas and I'll be able to try and kind of um, plan a program around that specific craft supply. Um, Bustle is kind of a BuzzFeed for adult women. It's a lot of pop culture stuff, um, but they also have a lot of book lists that can be really great for readers advisory. Um, and then BuzzFeed I use to kind of keep, mm, keep knowledgeable about about what's cool with the young people, <laughs> the teens and the young adults these days. There's a lot of really great video content on BuzzFeed and um, they have recipe videos. Sometimes they do crafts and stuff um, and it can be really helpful. Book Riot, I love. They have a lot of um, roundups of literary related gifts. They have, um, uh, again, a lot of book lists um, that you can recommend to your patrons. Ooh, excuse me. And then they also have, um, they have a lot of, every once in a while, they'll sprinkle in a specifically library related article that I, that are really interesting to read. Pop Sugar Books, again, um, book lists that are really great for readers advisory um, that are curated. Um, oftentimes they're curated by topic or by genre. Um, they have, for example, lists of uh, dystopian fiction, although I don't know that you would want to read a lot of dystopian fiction right now because we're basically living one. But um, they have um, lists of books by LGBTQ authors. Um, it's a really great resource. Uh, Google Trends, you can go to to see what um, has been Googled most often that day or that week, um, just to kind of um, think up some of the moment book displays or programs. And then Disney Family is a really cute website about obviously all things Disney. There's crafts on there, there's party planning, there's um, recipes, um, and it's a really cute resource for families. Um, so these blogs are, are, again, they're not library related, um, but they are all about crafting and you can get a lot of inspiration from them. Kara's party ideas. So Kara um, is a party planner and she's also um, an ambassador for uh, Michael's, Michael's craft store. Um, and she takes beautiful photographs of these parties she planned 
And what I like to use it for is you can just type in a theme if you're thinking of a specific themed program. So if you type in for summer reading, say fairy tales or dragons or unicorns, if you type in any one of those terms, you'll have a whole list of posts about parties that she's planned with really cool decor ideas, sometimes snack and craft stuff. It's a cool site. Um, Hands-on as we grow is a craft um, site for kids and you can search. It's really nice because um, you can search for um, uh, crafts by subject or crafts by um, age group, which is really helpful. And Farently Creative is similar kind of, but it's for adults. It's crafts for adults. There's also some recipes and decor on there. And then the is fabulous and first and fun and first. These are blogs that are written by um, first grade teachers and they have some really awesome literacy info, coloring sheets. Um, they have um, picture book lists for kids, but then they also have fun things that they have done in their classroom, organizational tips um, that I think can be really relevant to libraries as well. Um, I'm gonna take a drink really quickly. Okay, and then these are library specific blogs. So on the PowerPoint, I've only included ones that are currently active that are posting um, that have posted recently. Um, but in the handout, there are also some um, blogs that are not currently active, but their archives are pure gold. So I do even if the blogs aren't active, I, I encourage you to go look through their archives because there's a lot of great ideas there programming librarian so I might be biased because I do write for them um, but I really like this because it's not just youth ideas it's also adult teen um, you can look for outreach stuff fundraising um, there's a lot of stuff on there and um, you can search by the amount of money you want to spend the size of library I think or the type of library you can search um, so that's great Abby the Librarian is one of my favorites. She's a kid-centric blog. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, she's a kid-centric blog. She posts a lot of book lists and um, program examples. Most recently, she has posted about doing virtual bedtime stories and a Google Hangout book club, which I think is an awesome idea. The ALSC blog is the Library Services to Children. They're all about youth programming and news relevant to youth librarians. And Teen Services Underground is similar, but it's all about teens. Um, they're on hiatus right now due to the quarantine, but they have a lot of really great book roundups and just a lot of stuff that's relevant to teen librarians. In short, I'm busy is written um, by a librarian who shares her daily schedules and her programming recipes where she includes all of the stuff, including craft, snack, like she just does little recipes for you to follow. Um, she's also been recently posting about take home story times, which I love. I think that's a great idea. Super Library Marketing. Um, it's written by a marketing librarian who I believe is pretty well known. I think she's written a couple of books, but she shares things like um, flyer design, um, tips for social media marketing. Right now she um, is, there's a video series about social media marketing, marketing during the pandemic, um, which is really helpful. Um, Literacious is again, mostly kid youth programming centric. She does a lot of book lists and book themed parties and a lot of passive programs as well. Five Minute Librarian is one of my favorites. Um, they share a lot of lists that are relevant to those working in the library field. Um, they do, they seem to focus more on themed book displays, but they also do a ton of stuff. They did um, social media tips of, of, they talked about Snapchat. I think they talked about TikTok at one point. Um, there's just a, a whole bunch of good stuff there. So these three, Jay Brary, Lightsome Librarian, and Storytime Katie are all about um, story time for kids. Um, Jay Brary, I love because they share a lot of video content um, where they actually sing the songs to you and use the props, and that's really helpful. And Storytime Katie um, does a lot of outreach story times, which I find helpful as well. 
Ontarian librarian is for all ages, not just kids. Um, she shares her own displays from her library um, program examples and readers advisory tools. And she also has done recently a post about virtual story time. And then Teen Services Depot is one of my favorites for teen ideas. Um, Dawn is a teen services coordinator in Illinois, and she does some awesome crafts with her teens. And she does some larger scale programs. She's done like a K-pop, um, a K-pop party. She's done a comic con. She's done a murder mystery theater for teens. She's just done some really amazing stuff. Um, webinars are one of my favorite resources for coming up with new ideas. Um, these are just some of my favorite um, some of my favorite websites to go to to browse through their webinar archives and you can find webinars on all different kinds of stuff. Um, I personally have done a webinar on programming librarian and the RSO conference archives on programming in small libraries on a small budget. So go watch that. And other resource, resources. Listservs um, are basically a form of like passive mentorship that you can join to bounce ideas off of off of one another, get I get advice um, and stuff like that. And the ALA website actually has a pretty long list of different listservs that you can join um, with different areas of focus. Facebook groups, my personal favorites, and these will again be in that document. Um, library think tank, programming librarian interest group, and tiny library think tank. I find those all very helpful. And I find that usually if I have a question or a concern, I just type it in the search bar in the Facebook group, and I, I usually have an answer really quickly. Podcasts. Um, there are some library focused podcasts out there. I really like um, Storytime Out Loud, which is obviously all about story time. Um, Let's see, what are the other ones? Adventures in YA, and they basically talk about um, new releases in young adult fiction um, and nonfiction. And then circulating ideas. Um, those are a bunch of interviews with the people that help uh, libraries thrive. And the, again, those will be in the handout. Um, your own hobbies. So I found that often the most most popular or successful programs I have had are because I have brought my own interests, my own passions into the library. Um, I think that when your patrons can sense that you're excited about something, they'll be excited about it too. Um, for example, I did an off, I love the TV show, The Office. I know that's not an original thought, but I love it so much. And I did an office trivia night last spring and it was one of my most successful adult programs I've ever had. And I think it's because they could tell like how much I love the show, um, how much detail I put into it. And I just, I just think you should bring your own stuff into the library. Chances are, if you love it, there are going to be patrons who love it too. Publisher catalogs. Usually when I get these, I'll be honest, they usually go in the recycling bin, which is a great but they shouldn't because if you go through them, for example, and you see a bunch of books on a similar topic, chances are that that topic is going to become a big trend in the months to come. Um, so say five years ago, there were a lot of books coming out on make your own slime and that became a huge trend and still is a trend. Um, so keep an eye on that to see like what's going to come out and be the next big thing. ALA publications, so ALA Editions um, publishes a lot of really great um, library, like library related books. Um, and you can find books on just about every topic of librarianship. Um, and as I said, I do have a book coming out, hopefully in the fall. And again, it's on, on uh, programming in small libraries on a small budget. So go buy it. Um, and if you can't, these books can be kind of pricey. And if you don't want to buy them, you can usually get them through the state library or through interlibrary loan. We're almost done here. Um, hobby or craft stores. If Hobby Lobby ever opens up again, um, take, take a look at their craft aisles and just walk through and you can pick up some great ideas just walking through the aisles. Like um, you see a rock painting kit, maybe you want to do a rock painting program or a tie dye kit and you want to do a tie dye t-shirt teen program, um, stuff like that. You just never know where you can find inspiration. 
uh, bookstores. And I'm not talking about Barnes and Noble or half price books. I'm talking about like local independent bookstores. Um, a lot of times you can get display ideas from them or um, you can steal their decor ideas. Um, a lot of times indie bookstores also have events in their community that you could collaborate with them on or um, take their program ideas, make them your own. I visited a books, a children's bookstore in Monroe, Georgia. It's by Atlanta called The Story Shop. And it was the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. If you ever go to Georgia, you have to go there. They have um, a hobbit hole. They have an actual wardrobe that leads to Narnia and it goes into their story time room. They've got a yellow brick road painted on the floor, just all of these amazing little nods to um, children's literature. And I that inspired me to redo my whole children's area. And so now I got a bunch of cool stuff in my children's area just because I visited this bookstore. Like you never know what's gonna what's gonna inspire you. Um, other libraries are often very excited to share their ideas with you. Whenever I go on a trip or on a vacation, I always make a point to visit a local library to see what they're up to in programming, um, what their different spaces look like in their building, um, and it can be super helpful to visit other libraries. And then finally, conferences. If you can afford it and if it's in your budget, try to go to as many conferences as you can because there is no time I feel more inspired and excited about my job than when I'm at a conference. I always go home with a notebook full of ideas. You'll go back being able to kind of see your library with clear eyes. Um, and I, my, my particular favorite is the RSO conference just because, you know, rural and small libraries, it's the most relatable for me, I guess. Um, and you can also search for grants or scholarships if um, if it's not in your budget. Um, and I think I might, if we have, well, I'll see if we have questions first, um, but that's all I got. Does anybody have questions for me? All right, I'm gonna jump in. So before I do sort of a formal thank you, I do wanna see if there are other questions. So if you wanna pop them into chat, I have two. One is, um, I know you said you've got the, um, information in a handout that will be available, but somebody asked about the three Facebook groups that you particularly mentioned. Could you mention those again quick? Yes, those are in the handout as well, but it is um, Tiny Library Think Tank, um, Programming Librarian Interest Group, and Library Think Tank, which Library Think Tank, just as an FYI, can be a little, people get into battles on there sometimes, but it's really a great resource. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do another short one and I'm gonna do a little bit longer one. The last one that Janine just put is how many programs do you normally do in a month? In a month? Mm -hmm. Sometimes none, honestly. Um, I mean, I guess it just depends. It really, it really depends. I don't, we don't do any regularly scheduled programs besides one monthly um, toddler story time. Um, and then we do, obviously, we do a summer reading program in the summer, um, but I don't, it really depends on the month. Sometimes we do three, sometimes we do none. And then related to that, what kind of budget are you working with for your programming? Well, um, not a lot. Um, we, in total, my budget, including salaries and materials are is about 30,000 a year. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um so I I'm not sure what I have right now as my my programming budget. Um but we try to do a, some fundraising and stuff and we just I mean we really just have to do what we can. And then um how long does your summer reading program go? just through, through June. And then we have a carnival um, the Saturday before the 4th of July, and then it's over. Sometimes we do a couple smaller programs in um, August, but yeah, summer reading is usually just through the, throughout the month of June. All right, we've got about five minutes left and I have two slightly longer questions. The first one 
um, was a little bit earlier and you got lots of congratulations on getting a book published. Can you talk really quickly about how that happened? Um, so it probably started when I got, I got asked to write for the programming librarian blog. Um, and the reason that happened was I presented um, at the RSIL conference, I think in 2018, and there happened to be someone from the ALA at the presentation and they came up to me after and asked about writing for the programming blog because I had mentioned them in one of my favorite resources. Um, so then I started writing for them in November of 2018. And um, I just one day got an email from somebody from the from ALA editions just asking um, because there's not there's really not a lot of literature out there specifically specifically aimed at small and rural libraries. Um, and that's definitely a gap in the market, I guess. Um, so she just kind of asked if I'd be interested and we went from there. Right, um, one question on the fact that we, you talked about separating your work life and your home life, but then when you're on vacation, you go to libraries. <laughs> How does that work? I should have I mentioned that. And I did think about that. I'm like, that's kind of a contradiction. Um, so to me, I love going to libraries anyway. Before I, before I worked in a library, I would still visit other libraries just because I love books and I love classic children's literature and things like that. So I would kind of do that anyway. Um, I think there's a difference between, I don't know. I mean, it's not like I'm taking a clipboard in there into the other libraries and like taking notes. And I just kind of, I like it. I enjoy it. So if you don't enjoy visiting other libraries and that's a stressor for you, don't just ignore, just ignore me. <laughs> All right. Good. Thank you. Um, if you've got, I still want to get in a, a little thank you here, but we've got just one or two minutes left. Can you talk a little bit about the carnival that you organize every summer? Yes, so if you want to, I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, if you want to read more about it, I would suggest you um, you uh, visit the Programming Librarian blog and look, I think about a year or so ago, I posted all about how I did it, um, how we raised money for it, what I spent money on. Basically, um, I couldn't do it without grants and without help from the community. I'm very lucky to have a supportive family, um, supportive husband. Um, my brother uh, is willing to, he built a lot of the carnival games and stuff. Um, I'm just very lucky to have support from the community that they're willing to help. But yeah, I, I definitely suggest going to read that blog post if you want more details. Great. Thank you very much. So I am going to do a little formal um, wrap up here. So from the comments, it appears that Chelsea's presentation really resonated with you guys. And Chelsea, I hope you have a chance. Um, for those of you who don't know, if you've got the chat out, there's three little dots in the right hand corner. If you click on that, you can actually save the chat and you can take a look at it afterwards. So for people who want to go back and see that. And Chelsea, I hope you do because there were some really great comments there. Um, but I really hope that all of you in the audience today are really feeling inspired by all the ideas that Chelsea presented. And I really want to say thank you for helping us all get um, fired up again. Um, people really enjoyed this and it was really important. So thank you. Oh, good. Thank you.